morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you find yourself in the world. My name is Sophia Arend, and I'm the Global Blockchain Business Council's Communications and Content Lead. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Global Blockchain Business Council and Global Digital Finance's Global Leader Series. This is a weekly town hall we host with policymakers and business leaders around the world to hear their insights into their work, the state of blockchain and digital assets, and current global affairs. Today, we have the pleasure to be joined by Ed Vasey. He is Lord Vasey of Didcot and a member of the UK's House of Lords and member of the Communications and Digital Committee. And our host, Sandra Rowe, GBBC's CEO and a GDF board director for a conversation on the UK's digital policy and the state of tech and innovation. Just briefly before we begin, we would like to introduce our guest. Ed Vasey, as I mentioned, is a member of the UK House of Lords and was previously a member of parliament between 2005 and 2019. He has also served as the UK's government, culture and digital minister and is the longest serving minister in that role and was appointed privy councillor in 2016. In his role as digital minister, Vasey was responsible for the rollout of a successful rural broadband program to more than 4 million homes, the introduction of 4G and tax credits for film, television, animation and video games, which have helped make the creative industries the fastest growing part of the UK economy. We are so pleased to have him here with us today and we welcome your questions at any point during today's webinar. We kindly ask that you submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll take them throughout. And without further ado, I'll hand things off to Sandra to kick us off. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sophia. And Ed, thank you so much for joining us today. And what a timely uh, period it is. Uh, we met you actually first in Vegas. We shared a stage at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, back in January, which is actually 2020, hard for me to imagine, a whole different world. And then we met up again at Davos at the end of January. Uh, you were kind enough to participate on a policymaking panel during our uh, GBBC Blockchain Central in Davos. Uh, we obviously, your roles have changed. Uh, you, we obviously live in a very different world. We're gonna unpack some of that today. So to kick off, for those you know who have just heard about your amazing illustrious background, can you briefly just walk through the audience, because a lot of the audience comes from, comes from the technology sector, about how you got into politics, into policy, and um, how did you end up as the longest serving culture and digital minister? Uh, that's pretty cool. So it's good to see you again, Sandra, and thanks for reminding me of the world that uh, we've left. Uh, it is true. I mean, it's hard to recall our globe-trotting days where one day we're meeting in Vegas at CES and the next time we're meeting in Davos. And uh, I very much enjoyed the panel I was on with you uh, or with the GBBC talking about uh, digital currencies and Facebook's Libra. Um, so I, uh, I've been a member of parliament. That's uh, I guess a bit like a congressman. Uh, I was a member of parliament for 14 years from 2005 to 2019 and in 2010, when David Cameron won the election, he made me the culture minister. That meant looking after the arts, museums, galleries, opera, dance, ballet. But bizarrely, I also had a parallel job uh, of being the technology minister. And so I was looking after broadband and mobile phone coverage uh, and 4G, but also the inward investment, big tech like Facebook and Google, and the whole kind of startup scene, which kind of developed into things like fintech and artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, but it was quite a journey those six years. And weirdly, I linked my kind of culture role, which also include film and television with my tech role by saying that a lot of the reason we go online is because of content. So if you think about it, you know, the biggest tech companies in the world are really, to a certain extent, content companies, whether it's Google with YouTube or uh, Facebook with user generated content or Twitter where people obviously post a lot, Instagram and so on. So there is a kind of link there because as I say, I was responsible for a lot of the screen industries. And I can still remember somebody coming back from New York, you know, carrying an iPad. Uh, you know, this was when I was an MP. So the pace of change has been absolutely phenomenal. And also right. a lot of what I was involved with, which sort of touches on fintech, was obviously building the digital infrastructure like broadband. So that was very, that's very relevant. You know, a lot of the 
innovation we see in tech can't happen without the back end, without your smartphone or whatever, uh, being a platform for these new technologies and new consumer applications. So I spent six years uh, under David Cameron doing that work, uh, 2010 to 2016. And we'll talk a lot about what the British government did in that time to promote digital. I got fired when uh, David Cameron lost the Brexit referendum and a new prime minister came in. Uh, and then I got fired again. I went on to what we call the backbenches. I was a backbench MP. I got fired again when I voted against Brexit and uh, Boris Johnson, who was by then prime minister, fired me. Uh, and uh, I lost uh, what we call the whip. So I was no longer a conservative but he restored it just before the 2019 election. And then I went, I decided to leave parliament. And then Boris Johnson very kindly has put me in the House of Lords, which is our upper chamber, a bit like the Senate, thoroughly undemocratic. You're appointed for life, you're not elected. And in the House of Lords, I sit on the Digital and Communications Committee, which looks at all these kind of issues like FinTech and technology and digital. So that's a brief resume of my uh, career, but I got elected to parliament when I was about 35, 36. And before that, I've been working in public affairs and I've been a lawyer. So I've always been in and around the sort of policy making areas of, uh, of the world, if you like. Well, thank you so much for that um, detailed um, background on the various times that you've been elected, but also fired. You've gone through many different types of challenges. And uh, the fact that you are now back um, in a different role in government just shows that um, your experience, your skill set, you know, frankly, in this period of time is needed more than ever because let's face it, digital is accelerating. Many of us have been discussing how much during the pandemic, um, digital economy, digital related, uh, services have actually accelerated because people are distance and away and what happens to the other sectors where um, they haven't digitized or they're still in the process of um, evolving to a digital uh, world. Um, just to um, help our audience understand a bit better when as you sit now on the um, digital communications and digital committee what are some of the um, topics that um, seem the biggest challenges for right now um, for the committee and for you, what do you think about the most when you think about the UK and how you're going to advance um, the next leg of uh, economic recovery and also digitization in the UK? Well, I think the policy agenda is slightly misplaced if I can be quite frank with you, which is to a certain extent, I think politicians are often guilty of looking backwards rather than forwards. And uh, one of the things we tried to change under the Cameron government was to embrace change and the future. But I'm struck, I don't wanna be rude to my colleagues on this committee, they're all brilliant people, but it's interesting, for example, that we are just concluding a report on the future of journalism. And of course, the key point about the tone of the report is that you've lost a lot in local journalism because local newspapers are dying and therefore, what can we do to kind of save them? And to a certain extent, there's not enough thinking about, well, actually, what are the new models that are coming in that can change that? So if you take journalism, for example, you or I, if we were so inclined, could start a newspaper for our local town uh, and we could distribute it virtually free of charge. Uh, we wouldn't have a printing press or whatever. So we can do a lot with technology, uh, which just changes the way we provide a traditional service. You know, Uber is a good example where, you know, I always say, well, you know, some people think it's a bit of a, a bit slightly pathetic that the best technology can do is to change the way you hail a cab. But in a sense, that sums up what technology is about. It's about using the platforms that exist in the here and now and the future to provide services that people have to a certain extent always relied on. So uh, what worries me about the committee that I'm on is that we politicians spend too much time trying to save uh, the things that uh, used to happen rather than embracing the things that are happening and updating their regulations and their approach to embrace the way that the consumer and the customer is going. 
The other problem we have, which again, I think is reflected in the committee's agenda, although I am sympathetic, by the way, to what I'm just about to say, is politicians like to regulate. I think in a sense, I'm not anti-regulation. Uh, regulation is a good thing. It saves lives. It stops people getting ripped off. But we're likely in our next committee hearings to be looking at online regulation. How do we uh, ensure that people are free to speak uh, what, what, what is on their mind, but don't uh, harm people or how do we prevent conspiracy theories? So in the UK, that's a big, big issue. We have a, what is called the online harms agenda legislation that may be coming down the track uh, to allow politicians and regulators to intervene in the kind of free for all content that we see on platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Now, I'm not in principle against that, but I think your question has provoked me actually to think uh, in term, through the prism of my committee, what are the two problems for politicians? One is that we tend to look backwards. How do we preserve what, what has happened in the past rather than embrace the future? And we tend to regulate. And uh, we need to approach both those issues with some caution. Absolutely. And frankly, your time as um, culture and digital minister, minister uh, under Cameron, let's face it, I mean, the um, fintech digitization um, investments that you all made, the policy environment that you created allowed for an explosion of fintech. And now the UK is benefiting from that. So when we think about right now, um, you know, what needs to happen in the UK for digitization and particularly in media and the creative, um, you know, realms for that to explode again, because ultimately when there is innovation and don't get me wrong, I agree with you, we need to have guardrails and regulatory oversight so that there are not a lot of bad actors, but there is that balance of creating the environment to allow for that growth to explode and then eventually certain big players come out of it, unicorns, whatnot. Um, how do you see that happening for the digital economy now? What needs to happen in, if you were allowed to do whatever you wanted? So I thought a lot about this, obviously, because I speak about this a lot and I write about this a lot. Okay. Uh, I write about, to a certain extent, what we did under the Cameron government. And I think we were a very good government for the technology sector. And I think we were world leading, actually. And I think we're losing that lead to countries like France, which have picked up the agenda and obviously many other countries around the world. But, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, we have a phrase, Coles to Newcastle. Uh, Newcastle is a famous part of the north of England, which was famous for its coal mining. So the phrase Coles to Newcastle implies you're taking something to an area that already has it in abundance. But I felt with the Obama administration, for example, we were engaging with them and perhaps teaching them a bit about digital government uh, to an administration that, on the face of it was one of the most tech savvy administrations, well, probably the most tech savvy administration the US has had. So I felt at the time that the UK was a very leading country and the reasons are very clear and some of them are quite banal. The first is to say that you take the tech agenda seriously. I mean, that's such an obvious point to make, but it's really important. If you don't get up as a politician and say, this is a really important agenda, you know, look at what Biden is saying about climate change in a matter of a couple of weeks, arguably, the president yes. elect has put America back full square in the debate about climate change. Yes. So we as a government said tech is important to us. And then we set up a government body, but we did it in a way that it was light touch. It was led by the private sector to become a cheerleader for tech, to become a convener for tech. And out of that body came the initiatives like, what do we do about what do we do about cyber? What do we do about artificial intelligence? All these themes developed by setting up this body that became a convening body for people to effectively to talk to government. So it was a, a really open door, people coming in and out of Downing Street all the time, wearing shorts and t-shirts and so on, and being quite annoying like that, <laughs> but you know, I don't mind. And um, so that was really important. And then the third thing was to be flexible about policy and regulation. So, 
things like visas, for example, which I know is a, a big debate over in the US at the moment. Uh, you know, we had entrepreneur yep. visas came out of that dialogue between tech and government. Uh, and Innovate Finance, which is a trade body that supports t uh, fintech in the UK, an explicit decision by the government to encourage the creation of that trade body, uh, again, became a convener for all of this. And out of that became, you, you spoke to the regulators, so the financial regulators, set up their sandboxes so that startups in the fintech sector could go to the regulator and say, this is our company, this is what we're doing, these are the regulations we're coming up against, let's test out our systems, let's see if we can change the regulations or interpret the regulations in a more flexible way, because clearly regulations written 20 years ago couldn't possibly envisage the kind of uh, technology that we're bringing to bear on this transaction, you know, whether it's how you sign a document or how you identify people and do KYC and all of that. So all of that came out of tech. Now, I think we've lost a bit of that in the UK at the moment. We've lost it partly because we've been obsessed by Brexit. And like everyone else in the world, we've been knocked backwards by COVID. <clears throat> and we need to regain <clears throat> that initiative. You know, we were world leaders in government digital services. So government not only talk the talk in helping the tech industry uh, and startup sectors, it walked the walk by adopting uh, widespread digital practices from paying your tax to uh, applying for your driving license or even I discovered applying to be buried at sea became a digital service, the least used digital service, but it was nevertheless a digital service wow. that the government provided. So. We need to return to that kind of agenda, which frankly, I'm sounding a bit European centric here because I suspect that Asia and the West Coast are miles ahead anyway, but certainly in Europe, the French, I think are now doing a much better job at kind of cheerleading for tech and presenting themselves as a tech friendly nation, which is ironic because the French country is, is famously bureaucratic. I, I think you have made probably one of the most profound, and you, you're right, simple statements of, of recent weeks that I've heard, um, and I speak to a lot of people. The very fact that you have a world leader or a government come out and say, tech is at the top of our agenda, one of many priorities, but it is important to us, is actually crucial. And you've seen that with China and Xi Jinping. You've seen that with Macron. He did come out and say tech is absolutely on the forefront of our agenda. And so um, we, you know, I'll be very frank with you. I'm sitting in New York uh, with the new administration coming in. We're hoping that that also will be the case that um, innovation technology and particularly digital infrastructure and digital assets and blockchain included amongst all the emerging technologies uh, will be a top priority. The US has yet to articulate that at the federal level. And um, I also, I will concur with you, Ed. I lived in the UK for over 10 years, um, previously as a banker in London, and I watched the FinTech explosion happen under your watch. And frankly, um, I think the UK has walked back on a number of different areas and needs to regain um, that, that environment or create that envi recreate that environment again. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, I think um, we're still doing okay in fintech and we're still leading Europe in terms of venture capital investment and unicorns and all those measures. But uh, you and I both know that there are time lags in these scenarios and who knows what the statistics will show in two or three years time. I mean, fintech is a very good example of where I think government uh, did make a difference. So not only did we have the regulatory sandbox where uh, startups could talk to the regulators about what they were doing instead of, you know, sitting in silos and suddenly launching their product and finding that they were being threatened with fines or, or whatever. Uh, but also Innovate Finance, the trade body, be has become this great voice for fintech. Uh, but I think, um, uh, you know, the third thing is clearly, you know, we were working with the grain, if you like, in the sense that obviously London is a major global financial center. So if you're going to start a fintech company, there's no better place to do it than in London, where you've got an enormous concentration of financial expertise. And that's why we became a kind of European center, because as you will have known, Sandra, from your time in working in the city of London, 
uh, you know, you will hear dozens of languages spoken in the office and on the street. People come from not only just all over Europe, but from all over the world to work there. So the opportunity to acquire talent was there. And uh, I worry that Brexit will make that more difficult, uh, make London a less attractive place to base yourself in. It may be that the sheer power of London's financial market overcomes those hurdles, but it's a needless hurdle uh, that we're facing. Uh, so I think all of those put us in a very good position. And I think that, you know, we have some amazing companies, not, not just doing digital banking, but uh, digital IDs and payment systems. And to a certain extent, we're helped a bit by, I have to say, slightly facetiously, that America is pretty backward in terms <laughs> of Oh, you can say it. <laughs> consumer facing financial services, kind of trying to open a bank account in the US, trying to get any kind of official government document is deep, still deeply bureaucratic and still quite fragmented because of state financial laws. So yeah. the UK has a, a massive opportunity to continue to power ahead in the fintech world. And bringing it together your points, Sandra, I would say. That is a classic example where if government leans in mm -hmm. and says, yep, we're going to back this sector, uh, that it will pay massive dividends. Absolutely. And to your point about, um, you know, there are improvements on government services that ultimately benefit citizens that uh, can happen and be, should be driven. But also, you know, could you talk a little bit about other sectors, for example, healthcare, um, at least in the US, you know, it's such a mess and there's frankly a lot of bloat and waste. Uh, technology could actually help cut a lot of, the, trim the fat um, as it were. Um, there's all those sectors like um, climate change, um, technology can improve certain things related to, um, you know, how carbon credits are verified, uh, particularly those are blockchain use cases that are coming into play. How do you actually verify a carbon credit? It's true. And, and then that carbon credit only gets used once and not double spent. Um, so there's lots of these types of use cases coming. Um, when you think about where the UK could lead beyond fintech, um, is it the creative services? Is it healthcare? Do you think it could be also um, energy and climate change? Or do you see that across the map where the UK could lead? Yeah, I think those are good sectors. So first of all, on, on the blockchain specifically, I mean, that's another good example where, you know, we issued a uh, report on the blockchain way back in, I think, 2015. Uh, an example of where government again said, this is happening. We need to be across it. We need to be ahead of it. Uh, we got our chief scientist to write the report and he covered a whole range of sectors, not just obviously financial, but things like land registries and contracts and so on, where the blockchain use cases yep. were beginning to emerge. And we've done it again to a certain extent by setting up an artificial intelligence council, again, made up of industry players to look at the trends. In terms of the sectors where we in the UK have an opportunity to power ahead, I think health tech is a very, very good example. So uh, a guy called Matt Hancock, who was the digital minister after me, mm -hmm. went on to be our health secretary. He's now obviously world famous because he has to go on television every day to tell people how terrible the coronavirus is for the UK. Uh, but one of the things he did in peacetime before we entered the pandemic was to set up something called NHS X. And the guy he put in charge of it was the ex-head of... Um, uh, digital at the DC at, at the digital department and the ex head of cyber security at our national center for cyber security. So this guy with no medical background or health background is now mm -hmm. in charge of the national health services digital arm, and that's uh, a very good example of where you uh, kind of put your priorities right. You, you you make it clear that this is a tech play first rather than a health play first, if you like. Mm -hmm. And the idea is obviously we have a massive opportunity in the UK because the NHS is a centralized system providing, uh, uh, providing care for 60 million citizens and therefore having if effectively an overview of the healthcare provision of 60 million people in one pot, if you like. 
And that means if NHS gets it right, it can roll out digital innovation relatively quickly. But we have to deal with massive, massive legacy issues in health. You know, we have to deal with a lot of hospitals still using fax machines, sending out letters to patients. Uh, but clearly the pandemic has changed things in the sense of how we're discussing this issue, uh, the ability of telemedicine uh, to have an appointment with your doctor. And really health should have no borders. I should be able, if you, you could be my doctor in New York, I should be able to potentially communicate with you uh, on all sorts of things. But clearly it has issue, uh, the digital strategy and the blockchain and others have issues with patient records, the ability to make patient records secure, and portable, uh, the ability to analyze data, DeepMind based in London, part of Google, but part of an AI ecosystem, the ability there to uh, do uh, very fast diagnosis based on reams of data that's been entered from NHS central records. So healthcare is one issue. Uh, artificial intelligence leading on from that, uh, DeepMind, the, the founders of DeepMind, although they've sold to Google, mm -hmm. have been very explicit that they want DeepMind to stay headquartered in the UK. And they make the point that they are richer in talent than any university in the world in terms of AI talent. And DeepMind is throwing off AI startups all over the place. Green energy, we have massive expertise in offshore wind, uh, but clearly, uh, tech and environmental uh, technology is a massive opportunity for the UK. Uh, we're hosting COP26 next year. And that can be really, really boring, but essential stuff like uh, the monitoring of engines to reduce fuel consumption is a tech play that's very important. So uh, there are huge opportunities there. Space, uh, the UK is one of the leaders in the space industry and people forget we look at SpaceX, we look at potential base on the moon, we look at a trip to Mars, but actually space is about satellites and use case scenarios on the ground where the UK is one of the world leaders in building and designing satellites now. So there's a plethora of industries where the UK can forge ahead. Uh, absolutely, and you've named uh, quite diverse uh, industry sectors where uh, the UK has an edge and um, appreciate that. Uh, you've got actually a number of questions that have come in, but I'm going to just take a little bit more time to go through the ones that I've actually um, uh, prepared. So uh, we'll do a couple more of these and then we'll head into deep dive into some of the audience questions. But um, let's talk about digital infrastructure because you helped build out physical infrastructure as in bring broadband to millions of homes in the UK during your tenure as minister. Um, and that was critical, especially with the introduction of 4G. Um, we're now moving into a place where um, people are talking about digital infrastructure. And don't get me wrong, you still need broadband, you still need inter good internet access to be able to leverage digital infrastructure. But what I mean by digital infrastructure is now the super the digital super highway on which people will build applications what people are calling the next generation internet or the fourth industrial revolution however you want to call it um China has already come out and said with their bsn network they're launching bsn international um you've got um you know other countries saying they're going to lead in different categories it's a battle to be had, it's happening now. A lot of it is blockchain based. Um, the rails are important. And so when you think about it from a UK perspective, um, do you see a world where the democracies, meaning the UK, India, US, the EU, could actually come together to come up with a plan for digital infrastructure in, in that sense? Um, because what we're beginning to see is that the absence of leadership, others will come in and take that role. Yeah, I think you're totally right there. I think, uh, you know, we forget that uh, governments, government leadership is absolutely vital in setting standards. And to a certain extent, we have uh, lost out, if you like, uh, maybe that's too pejorative a phrase to the Chinese in setting 5G standards. And, uh, you know, the Chinese government got full square behind 5G just as getting full square behind 
quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Uh, and we need to regain, if not the initiative, at least parity with the Chinese in terms of how we set uh, global technical standards. Uh, we're just beginning the road out of 5G here in the UK. We're behind the US now, having been you know, ahead of the US in the days of 3G kind of 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so uh, we need to forge ahead with that. We need to forge ahead with uh, uh, near edge data centers. So mini data centers that start to process the internet of things. Uh, we need to look at applications for the internet of things and have them led by government and sponsored by government. So there's a whole range of different technical standards and technical innovations where again, uh, it seems to me, uh, I hope I'm not being unfair on the government here, that we are to a certain extent drifting uh, without the kind of sense of urgency that we need to see if we're going to stay ahead. But I think your point is very well made about an alliance of like-minded democracies that um, don't want to build a walled garden around what they're doing, yeah. but certainly want to take leadership in the setting of international standards. Uh, and the countries you described are the natural allies in this endeavor. Certainly when I was a minister, I worked extremely closely with the US administration. And I think some of those people are gonna come back into leadership positions under President-elect Biden. And they were the best of America in the sense that they were reasonably hawkish on the Chinese and the Russians, but they were hawkish only in the sense that they wanted to keep open standards and an open internet and a multi-stakeholder approach involving civic society and business as well as government to how we develop technology and technical standards. And that's something I hope that we can recapture uh, under the new administration. Well, it's, we're grateful that uh, you are a voice of not only um, advocating for tech, but actually know what you're talking about, which is sometimes um, not always had in government. I'm not talking about just the UK government, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> you have a lot of questions coming in. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, flip to some of the questions very shortly, but I'm going to ask you one more. I've asked you a lot of questions related to what government can do for the citizens, but let's turn it on its head. What do you need from entrepreneurs, from uh, thinkers who uh, could help you with education or provide you with information? What's the best way that those in the tech sector can actually help you? to make the case uh, to your peers and to others? I think uh, what the tech, said, the tech sector can do for government is what any sector could do for government, which is to speak with one voice. And mm -hmm. again, it's a profoundly obvious point, but the I was always a minister that wanted to listen to business. And I always took the view that if, if you've got people working at the chalk face who are developing businesses and interacting with their customers every single day, you should be listening to what they're telling you. They will be telling you about trends, about where people are going and how they're using technology. Uh, and they'll be telling you about the kind of unnecessary obstacles they need to overcome. But what you can't deal with is three different people coming in and telling you four different things. Mm. Much, much easier for government if those three different people sit in the room outside work out that they're saying four different things. By the time they come into ECU, they're saying one thing. So that's right. point number one. I think the second point, which is slightly unfair to business because people are working 24 seven on creating their businesses is obviously uh, in this world that we now live in, technology moves at such a pace that I don't think education finds it easy to keep up. And I would like to see in the future a much more hybrid model particularly at the higher level of business and uh, education. So we're addressing that a bit with the introduction of apprenticeships where more and more people are now, you know, leaving school and going, getting their qualifications while they're working. But I think, you know, so much of, you know, we've only scratched the surface of what technology is capable. Of. I didn't mention ed tech when I was going through some of the industries where the UK could be a leader, but Right. It seems to be pretty scandalous that we still have this very traditional uh, university model. Uh, we still have a very traditional classroom model. So much of how we teach kids can change. So much of what we learn at university can change. I don't want to take away, by the way, 
you know the physical life i mean i'm talking to you while my kids are at school thank god uh yeah. i want my kids to be in school but yeah. i still find it bizarre the way they learn that they learn exactly the same way i learned 40 years ago right and a lot of that has to change so i think i would love to see this is a slightly tangential point but i'd love to see the tech do more in terms of transforming education because it becomes a virtuous circle. They'll start to get the kind of people they need to help their businesses grow. Uh, Ed, you make an excellent point. Uh, I will tell you right now, we're working with a country in the Middle East who's looking at an overhaul of their entire ed tech um, uh, at the country level, just because it's a smaller country um, from birth all the way through to uh, mid-career change or later stage career change, the expectation that you will no longer have just one career or the need for constant continuous learning and adoption of different skill sets over a lifetime. That mentality is very different than our current education systems around the world. And it's, it's gonna be tough, but I agree with you. A uh, combination of government working with the private sector who are focusing on problems in this space um, will come up with um, solutions. But um, ed tech is a huge one, especially now with uh, what's going on not only with the pandemic, but digital disruption. Um, you don't need a college education for a lot of the digital jobs that are out there. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I want, I obviously want us to come back to real life. Uh, you know, we're in our second lockdown at the moment and um, nothing beats meeting in person, I have to say. Uh, yeah. Nothing beats sitting in a room, talking through a problem, exchanging ideas. Uh, but we also, I think, know that we're going back to a hybrid life, which is good. I mean, of course, we are the lucky ones. We are, to a certain extent, the white collar workers who can work from home. So I don't want to underestimate what the pressure that a lot of other people are, are under. But I still want to go in and meet people and I still want my kids to be in school, but I want them to be getting uh, personalized learning delivered via computer. I don't see why they're you know, their computers should be open and they should be learning in the classroom with a teacher. But that should be a hybrid model even when they're in the classroom. Absolutely. And um, if it's OK with you, I'm going to start taking some questions from uh, the audience. You've got Emma, who has said um, David Cameron's government seemed a lot more pro business quotes, uh, then recent government, uh, Rishi Sunak recently gestured uh, to startups that and tech companies um, in a more positive tone. Do you think this government will now take a more pro-business approach, especially technology? Yes, yeah, so Rishi Sunak is our chancellor, our finance minister, and uh, he's young, he's 39, and uh, he comes from a city background. He worked in the in financial services. He's extremely tech savvy. I, I remember going to um, Silicon Valley last year and somebody saying, you know, do you know my friend Rishi Sunak that I used to work with? So he's quite mm -hmm. well connected in the valley. And uh, he looks like a bit like a techie. He wears very sharp suits. So mm -hmm. I think he's uh, going to be very pro-business. And uh, clearly he's in a bind at the moment. You know, we've spent money like it's going out of fashion. Right. And he, he would like to kind of get back to some kind of fiscal probity, but he's very narrowly boxed in. We have a, a problem in this country, so in the UK, which is that we have the legacy of Brexit. So Brexit is due to happen at the end of this year. But one of the legacies has been because after the referendum vote, we voted to leave the EU. And obviously that vote had to be respected. But a lot of people, whether it was the smallest business of two people or huge businesses employing thousands of people all said this is going to be an absolute nightmare because of the huge amount of bureaucracy and barriers it's going to throw up that we're long that we've long since got rid of and of course this was taken as a sort of attack on all the people who voted for Brexit so the war between the side that had won the Brexit side who are now the government and business became pretty intense mm. to the extent that Boris Johnson is reputed to have said naughty word business. Um, and so it became a kind of weird culture war between a pro-business government 
and the business community it was meant to re represent. I think it may get worse before it gets better because we've yet to see, we'll see in January what some of the impact of Brexit is in terms of, you know, how you get a lorry across the English Channel. Mm. Uh, but I think in Rishi Sunak, we have a finance minister who wants to do what he can for business, yeah. wants to support tech and uh, gets it. I think he just issued this week something on a digital currency consultation. He's um, started a consultation about the London Stock Exchange to try and make sure that, that is fit for purpose as more and more tech firms come on stream. So he still admits, admits this kind of total financial crisis and meltdown still trying to look ahead and and push ahead with innovation so uh i hope normal service can resume next year once we've got brexit out of the way well we will never get brexit out of the way but when we've at least moved beyond debating it right and when hopefully we might have the pandemic under some kind of control yeah, no, these are truly challenging times for any policymaker. Um, now you're not allowed to ask me, Sandra, any of these incredibly hmm. technical questions. Whoever Trey is. <laughs> has, Trey, uh, you're asking very hard questions here. Yeah. No, actually, I'm going to um, take one of Trey's questions here and say... Um, not the EHR, EMR one, are you? Yeah, but before we jump to that one, I will actually ask you the one that's sitting at the top. Um, and not being focused on the current next hot topics is frankly an issue the Lord has highlighted. This is refer referring to your politicians looking backwards. Um, what do you think is needed to bridge the gap? What, what needs to happen? And again, you did mention that people need to come to you with one voice as opposed to having four different types of, you know, views um but will you or or is is the government thinking of setting up yet another sort of um tech public private sector group to parse through some of the digital challenges um has one been set up for ai already is that right did you mention yeah would, so would there first of all can i thank anonymous attendee to refer yeah for referring to me as the lord <laughs> you know, i now have godlike powers <laughs> to answer all your questions um so the lord says this that um i think it is uh to a certain extent a question of age um you have people in their 50s making policy and they're looking at the world that they grew up with you know i still listen to the music i listened to when i was 15 and i haven't moved on in terms of music and part of me wants the world uh, to be the same, I'm thinking about buying a vintage second-hand petrol car when my head is telling me you're crazy because every car is going to be electric in 10 years. What are you going to do with this piece of metal in your garage? Right. Uh, so we, uh, you know, we, we try and keep the life we had in our 20s, I guess. And that's, so politicians, uh, it's a very long way of saying politicians are human. Secondly, don't forget the power of lobbying and I, I don't say that particularly in a sinister way right but established industries that are under threat come and tell you oh you've got to stop this we're being destroyed so you know who are the biggest uh anti-facebook and anti-google people not that i'm denying for a second that there aren't big problems with facebook and google right uh, but a lot of it are the newspapers and they've been disrupted but they're highly influential with politicians so of course they're going to say Sure. these guys are terrible you have to regulate them uh your black cab drivers in london are going to be the ones that block up the square because of uber so there'll yes. be a lot of established industries with good connections with politicians who will say save us save us and it's a brave politician that turns around and says you can't be saved or you have to adapt so that's the problem uh and it may and it will change with time it will change as each new generation comes in you know i witnessed as a minister the changing climate on video games when i became an mp most mps talked about video games as being things that created serial killers and by the time <laughs> i left because my generation played video games it was about the massive contribution that video games make to our economy so some of it will change but it's always good to have younger politicians people think you need to be experience and have had a proper career before you uh i don't want to say anything too controversial but you know on this side of the atlantic 
however radical you think she may be in terms of her communication skills someone like AOC <clears throat> is for me a very compelling uh, politician and I think part of that is because she is a younger generation uh, bringing that younger generation sensibilities to the political debate. Um, appreciate that and um, if you don't mind you're getting a few different topics that are questions that are really kind of hitting upon data. So if we can move to data, and I think really data, privacy, big data, what's government's role in dealing with that, right? Do you let it proliferate and then put in some guardrails later? Do you have strict rules around consumer protection, around data um, so that you can avoid more Facebook, Google, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, scenarios. Um, should citizens be able to monetize their data, right? That's a lot of the discussion that's happening in the blockchain world, which is the concept around 360 degree economy, circular economy models where people get paid for knowing that they're posting things that are going to a company, but they should get paid for that. Um, so any thoughts that you have related to um, the usage of data, especially consumer data is appreciated. Well, this is a brilliant question, and uh, I'd like to talk about this a bit, and I'd love also, Sandra, to learn either now or later about the, the, uh, the blockchain, because I think this could be crucial. So <clears throat> just before this webinar, I was coming off a call with our data minister, and the UK in September published a national data strategy, which uh, I think is quite interesting and exciting. <clears throat> uh, to a certain extent, it deals with a lot of very routine and mundane issues, but nevertheless very important. One is, how do we standardize data? How does government process all this data in a standard format so that it can be read across? So your health data can be read with your education data, with your whatever data. Secondly, as you can tell from the hand gestures, how do you get this data out of silos? How do you get this data to right. talk to each other so you can really start to add value to the different data sets that you have? And then thirdly, how do you apply this data? How do you keep this data secure and private? How do you balance the need to have large amounts of data to help you inform policy with keeping people's data private? And also data skills, which is really important. How do we start to generate the kind of skills that we need to handle this data economy? And underlying all of this, of course, is the fact that, you know, I know it's a cliche that data is the new oil, but data is everything. I mean, it is everything. It's the new trade route is data. You know, we have this unseen trade war going on where the EU and the US cannot yet agree data standards, the privacy shield. And the UK now is caught in the middle because we've left the EU where we had their data standards. Uh, and we, we also have to now agree data standards with the EU. Anyway, so that's really important, all of that. And then moving on from that, which I think is, uh, comes from your questions and from the question posted, is what's the next stage? So there are a lot of people who say the national data strategy isn't ambitious enough. I'm not one of those people because I recognize that government has to get the basics right before it can start being really innovative and entrepreneurial. But yes, somebody was making the point to me yesterday when I was talking about the national data strategy. You know, go if you look at Google's accounts, you won't see a line in the account saying data. Yet that entire company is built on data. Its entire value is based on the data that it holds. And yet there is no valuation of the value of that data. And secondly, if you do start to value data, uh, you might improve data security. If a company knows it's got a data set that's worth $150 million for the sake of argument, I think the board will start to talk about how are we keeping this data secure? <laughs> what are our policies about this data? In a way that I bet a lot of boards are not talking about their data. Even supermarkets are not talking about their data. And thirdly, dare I say, I don't want to upset anyone, but if you start to value data, maybe governments could start to tax the data. Uh, maybe this could be a, a way of dragging government tax revenues into the 21st century. Yep. And finally, uh, what about data trusts? Can you set up corporate governance models just as you have a corporate governance model for your pension fund in your company? Should there be a corporate governance model for your 
data in your company that makes sure that it's properly looked after, but also could there be data governance companies set up so that small companies can make sure that their data is being properly managed and looked after. So these are huge areas. There's a whole economy that yes. no one really talks about. So it's a brilliant question. I'd love to know also if the blockchain is going to be, is sitting there as a potential opportunity. I'm sure, I mean, it already is. I'm displaying my ignorance in terms of knowing a lot about the blockchain, but clearly this is a blockchain massive, massively underpinning all of these policy thoughts and ideas. Well, I mean, to be frank, there are a number of different use cases where blockchain could apply, but I think where some of the most compelling use cases where it applies is when you need to verify that that data is true. And then you can make sure that it is cryptographically um, confirmed. Um, there's a hash to prove. You don't need to believe me. You don't need to believe the third party. It's there on a blockchain to say that that particular data set is true, which then, by the way, also allows for in a ideal world where I can verify to you the information that you want. So the classic example that people give is the legal age for drinking. I shouldn't have to show you my driver's license or my passport, which has a whole bunch of other information on there. What if I want to go to a club or, you know, an over whatever, 1821 um, location, but it, I can just show you a QR code, which is verified through a blockchain hash that I am indeed over 21 or 18 and therefore let me in. You don't know what my birth date is. You don't know anything else because that's all you need to know. And I get entry. And the idea that we refine, especially consumer data, to the point where we're not constantly giving out sensitive data over and over and over again unnecessarily is um, an area I think that's quite interesting. One thing I will have to say. Do you know this um, company, uh, Yoti, in the UK? What company? Yoti. That's very much their thing. You should. I should introduce you to them. Anyway. Absolutely. We'd love to talk to them. Um, and I think the other thing that um, I, I had a closed door session with the U.S. Judiciary Committee on the Senate side um, late last year, uh, and one of the and the topic was around data privacy, and obviously Congress is working through you know what they're trying to do around passing bills uh, around data privacy, protecting businesses yet also protecting the consumer. One thing that did come up constantly as a thematic was data. All data is not equal. So meaning different types of data are more sensitive than others. And therefore the classification of the various different types of data, financial, health, those sit at a very different level than some of the other pieces of data that are out there. Even those classifications are not, uh, there are no standards around that. And that's just a basic thing to do. Exactly, that is so right. So I think, um, government could really help with some of those basic ground level work, working with, of course, other bodies, but getting those standards across countries, I think could help a lot. Um, just laying out some of the more fundamental things before you start getting into the really um, hairy, more contentious discussion topics around data privacy. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Sandra. I've got to uh, go to my digital committee now at the House of Lords. Absolutely. We thank you so much. And apologies to the rest of the audience for those we could not answer all your questions, but we really appreciate uh, the amount of uh, enthusiasm for the Lord, the digital Lord. Yeah, I'm thrilled. <laughs> and, I'm thrilled yeah. that so many people turned up and people asked questions. So thank you. Um, but uh, we'll have you back at some point in 2021, hopefully in a very different state. But we thank you for advocating for technology, innovation, and frankly, um, the more we can help you also and your colleagues with blockchain and um, digital assets, we're here for you. You're a Thank star, you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. And Sophia, over to you. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll keep it short. Um, we'll send a link around uh, of the recording for everyone and relevant links for you to learn more. Thank you so much.